Welcome to Acid Horizon. We are in an age that is increasingly defined by its drive to isolate, define, and optimize life. We are told that we are among the blessed if we represent our age in this way. And if not, we risk the salvation of all. We must accord with this liturgy of optimization or face the slow biopolitical liquidation that sits on the other side of even the most minute of disobediences. We live in the consistent calculation of risk and security. There is no shortage of texts trying to grapple with, and often poorly, Foucault's concept of biopolitical modernity, but today's guest's approach is a little different. Our guest asks, what modes of thought brought about this government of the living? How did its object come to be known and to be manipulable? and to be scaled to this concept of population. How have we found ourselves in the grip of this smart being? In the tradition of Tikkun, Agamben, and Foucault, Serene Richards is less interested in optimizing this optimization of life, like many polemicists of technology, but in showing that the innocent malignance of these systems needed a very specific form of thought to hold sway over the entire interpretability of our world. Biopolitics, for Serene Richards, must be understood as a system of thought. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Serene. We're really excited to have you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, no, we're super excited. We we don't cover Foucault uh, as much as I'd personally like to. So <laughs> it's always it's always good to, to, to do a biopolitical episode. But... I want to get started with the concept that you you throw out in in the preface, which is this notion of smart being. Mm -hmm. And what exactly for you is this being that is that is smart? And why does it sort of define or at least give give rise to a particular way of approaching our biopolitical world? Yeah, I think that's a really great question um, to start with. So I obviously smart being is kind of put forward as, um, I suppose, like a caricature of um, subjectivity within our techno-capitalist techno um, mode of life. It's the kind of being that um, is seduced by um, certainty, by safety, um, and is, let's say, fearful of um, anything to do with the uncertain, anything that might be a bit um, risky. So it's just a kind of way of going about life, trying to secure um, a kind of, like a kind of idea of success, a kind of idea of the good life that ultimately is dominated by um, the capitalist mode of production, um, any kind of uh, idea of enjoyment is enjoyment defined by um, the market or technological, um, yeah, technological techniques. Um, so, but at the same time, um, so this, the idea of smart being isn't limited to a particular territory. So it's not that, you know, certain people in certain countries, let's say like the UK, um, are smart beings. It's, it's a kind of mode of subjectivity that is um, global and perhaps more clearly defined by a particular class. Um, so, yeah, what I imagine is probably someone who's, you know, well-traveled, well-educated, um, and that really believes in the solutions of techno-capital. One of the things that I find really interesting and really specifically unique to this book <laughs> is that its object is biopolitics, but it doesn't take the, the standard route to the question of the threshold of modernity that Foucault calls sort of the biopolitical age. Um, you make sure that the reader really first starts at the object of biopolitics, which is the living human being. Mm -hmm. And you take us through a kind of history of philosophical anthropology, which was at the core of Foucault's super early work. I mean, 20 years 
before Foucault would even start to talk about biopolitics. He would be writing about um, Kant's anthropology. Um, and the standard sort of striation of Foucault's work is that there's the Kantian era, the Heideggerian, you know, Dasein, Annalise uh, era to the archaeology, to genealogy, to ethics. And you kind of vanquish that dis distinction and show that sort of the entirety of, um, of Foucault's work sort of reaches this, this particular moment, this government of the living. So I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about the importance of Foucault's analysis of, of philosophical anthropology in the emergence of biopolitics in his thought? Yeah, no, that's a really great, um, it's a really great question. Um, I think the way um, that I kind of approached um, making these connections was thinking, well, okay, if biopolitics is conceptualized as a technique of government, and um, we'll go into it in a bit more detail later on, then when Foucault obviously um, describes the, the anthropologization of philosophy, um, the function of the human sciences in delineating um, particular parameters to do with life. You know, he talks about labor, he talks about um, other things. The, and these basically set up the parameters and the conditions of, of how life should be lived. And so I couldn't, I couldn't see how these could be disconnected that obviously the, the you know if if government has to do with the living has to do with organizing social life in a sense then obviously um the raison d'etat as we as we could say kind of derives from these forms of knowledge um that that were elaborated on in a very particular way, in a very specific way. So drawing from evolutionary biology, drawing from um, contemporary linguistics. Um, and so I think that, yeah, for Foucault, that that was really important. Um, yeah. And the key obviously is um, the inquiry into man. So as I go into it um, in the book, it starts from Kant's edition of the fourth question, you know, what is man? Setting up man as um, both the object of knowledge and the subject of knowledge and resituating um, himself throughout, you know, retrospectively throughout um, the history of humanity as that subject. Um, you know, so I thought that was really interesting. And I think that particularly thinking about um, how Foucault frames that in relation to the connection to, to life and the living, to how we should live. Um, because obviously, you know, whatever discoveries are made in, um, let's say, biology or in, um, in economics, then come to define politics, then come to define um, the question of, okay, well, how do we increase um, the minimum wage in this context? Or how do we amend this policy in relation to this body of knowledge, this empirical study, etc. So the two are kind of um, connected and it function together, I would say. I mean, if I could pick up on some of what you're saying regarding philosophical anthropology and its relationship to, to governance, I mean, I, I understand. In terms of philosophical anthropology, I think one of my main references and Foucault's as well is, is someone like Feuerbach, and I'm wondering if in terms of the, the sort of the split that happens within the idea of the human, is there a split that occurs within the idea of the human that arrives on the scene at the same time as we're trying to do this philosophical anthropology? And so, what I mean by that, just just I'm unpacking it a bit for the listeners, is is there a split between, say, the essence of man and human beings, or the human, you know, capital T, capital H, and human beings? And does that end up becoming something like? Uh, the standards that you know all of us uh, the essence of man partakes in all of us and yet no individual human being is the human essence is, is, is the essential and therefore that becomes kind of like a governing principle is, is that the kind of split that's working here a split between the species and sort of speaking for the species on the side of the governing sort of ideology or the philosophical anthropologist who the government 
draws upon for their policy making and individual humans themselves who you know, being particular can ever be this, this universal um, object that is known in, in anthropological studies. Oh, no, that's um, that's really interesting. Um, I think that I, I would situate the split more in relation to um, the separation between essence and existence. So um, all these knowledges basically function mainly to inform, you know, existence. So how life should be lived. Um, so taking as given the idea of wage labor, et cetera. And the essence of the human being is thought to be kind of fixed, that it's the human being um, that's a political animal, that has language, um, that um, is, is rational, is a willing subject. So these are kind of taken as immovable. And the idea is then to govern existence so that it matches up with what's already been prescribed and defined as the essence of the human being. And so, you know, if obviously, you know, as human beings, we're unpredictable, um, we might not always act in ways, you know, that, that might be rational, etc. Then that is precisely what makes, it gives government um, its sense, you know, intervening in those aspects of, um, yeah, our behavior or modes of conduct in order for them to then con conform to a specific idea of um, human essence. And so for a long time, this was basically um, morality, you know, even statistics as a science initially um, started out as being called uh, the science of morality, so the moral sciences. So concerned with deviance, concerned with, um, you know, unemployment or prostitution and so on. So, yeah, the philosophical anthropology functions in a sense to reinforce um, assumptions that are taken to be truths with regards to the essences and then kind of providing the tools to um, manage, let's say, or govern existence to match up with um, presuppose, presupposed human essence, whatever it might be. I hope that answers the no, question. Thank you. No, no, absolutely. If, if it almost seems it. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, no, no, no. Go why should I say something? It, it's almost as if uh, the points of governments, governance in this sense, is to humanize us, to humanize human existence, mm -hmm. as if human existence is not human enough. And it seems that uh, to go kind of dialectical about it, it seems that in a way this humanization has to bring a bit of contrary. That mm -hmm. is dehumanization established mm -hmm. through that. That, that process because is, is that the case in terms of insofar as every every particular human in existence is not the universal is not the essential they are therefore in a sense inherently inhuman and remain mm. so through the process of governance but that aspect is to essentially Im implant within them this this is essential thing which humanizes them even if they are in a sense already human no, absolutely. And I think that that's a great way of, of putting it. You know, it's a kind of it's it's a process that by by definition is never ending because what you know, one never reaches completion. There's always a training that one can undergo. There's always something um, something else that one can do to better oneself, to better achieve or attain this um, degree of humanness, let's say. Um, and of course, always in view with with a view to something to to a fictional kind of standard, something that doesn't really exist. And um, you know, back in the nineteenth century, when um, Adolf Kittler, who was a statistician and um, astronomer, I believe, um, basically you know came up with this idea of the average man. You know, for a long time, that served as the norm, the ideal standard that everyone should kind of attain and of course by definition the average is no one you know it's con all all the units of, of the population to speak along those terms are kind of contained in that but it functions as a way not just of of government but also of self-government in relation to that particular norm so it's a kind of um rationality that allows for um that to take place what's interesting here is that it, it sort of shows us the problems that we run up against when we sort of try to boil all of this down to di a dialectical history mm -hmm. right 
the emptiness of the normate is not something that says, okay, well, now we have to think in terms of the particular as opposed to the universal. It's such a uh, such a, a decatonic structure sort of falls apart when mm -hmm. we're talking about something like like normalizing power, precisely because th that exceptional space is empty. Um, and what's what's sort of interesting here is that we talk about um, the individual, the subject man, but one of the things that comes about in the 19th century, and you talk about this with um, the separating or giving Foucault's account of Xavier, Xavier Bichat and the clinic, is that uh, this thing we call man, the more outside of this space of the norm uh, an individual is, the more individualized they are, the more of an individual they become. Um, so rather than sort of this, this clean distinction between uh, uh, an individual who's, uh, you know, stripped bare of subjectivity and and so on. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit more complicated because with each of these like various attributes or trainings, uh, there is a kind of uh, individuation going on. And I'm wondering if uh, there's anything in sort of the history of of metaphysics when you talk about the laws of social statistics that give rise to um, this sort of paradigm of government that is in relation to sort of two things like foresight and the norm. Uh, and, you know, why was it important to bring the norm, which is something that's so crucial to, to Foucault's earlier work on discipline, into this space of, of biopolitics, which seems to have a much grander object, right? The whole of population and its mobilization. Oh, definitely. I think um, essentially it comes down to, you know, evolutions in the, the mode of government. What I mean by that is a shift away or a kind of um, new emphasis, let's say, with the idea of certainty and with the idea of the future. So making the future knowable, making the future certain, and so in a sense, bringing the future into the present. Um, so in, in, the, in the context of um, metaphysics, this would be trying to get a handle on this, the idea of the improper, um, either you know expelling that or integrating it somehow with reference to language, um, you know, constructing language as a science that isn't necessarily, um, yeah, that, that basically excludes anything that might not be grammatically um, correct. You know, the idea from Lacan of la langue, the not all of language, and basically imagining or setting up, let's say, the ground or foundation as though these these things can be um separated out or um excluded from thoughts and all the while they continue to exist but this this gesture this movement um then comes to be applied to um individual behavior and um, of conduct and obviously when you have um you know the the beginning of the work ethic um, in the 17th century that Foucault describes, for example, through the Great Confinement. So as Foucault um, basically says, you know, the general hospitals um, where people were confined to during the Great Confinement didn't necessarily have anything to do with work, um, but rather to instill an ethic. And so you kind of have this the, these movements. And at the same time, the 1600s, calculable probability, um, basically presenting the state with an image of the population and therefore an image of trends, various trends that emerge depending on the questions um, asked. Obviously, this isn't something neutral. Um, the interpretation of data is always um, subjective in a sense. And so, yeah, the norm allows for the government of the present, but also allows for um, making the future 
certain. But obviously, that's impossible. The more you look into the future and discover certain unknowns, the more unknowns then go on to emerge. And so it's a continuous process. And if we think about how um, criminal justice has, has changed in the last, let's say, 30 years, the emphasis is more on um, preemption, you know, stopping crime before it takes place. Um, and so that's yeah, the origins of, let's say, actuarial justice, using methods of accounting in, in criminological practices. Um, yeah, so I think this emphasis on the future and making the future certain is is what's at stake. And particularly, you know, thinking about smart being, that's um, the impulse um, that kind of dominates its its life. You know, trying to make sure that the future is known to a certain extent before it it, it actually comes about or takes place. Hmm. In regards to this, this question of preemption actually one of the things mm -hmm. that i'm really interested in is the the history of preemption and um, particularly in terms i mean well you know for me we all created a did help you know but that was one of the main things that thinking about the book is this concept from cybernetics of, of feed forwards and mm -hmm. it's i'm wondering how this connects to the contemporary state of smart being in terms of security because one of the things that i think we, we've tried to work out was this there seems like there's an inherent uh, self-defeating nature to biopolitical kinds of securitization, which is in the aim to preempt. Typically, we looked at history of governance, and generally, these systems tended to learn these these feed-forward systems, these pre these preemptive systems, learn from their mistakes because mm -hmm. feed-forward learn through feedback. But do we do we think that in a way that the the constant need to preempt and the sort of the speed at which we can receive information about potential risk? and potential futures do we think that preemption in the way is especially in contemporary sort of cyber culture or digitized existence that this this aspect of feedback is kind of being lost because the the, the fear of error ends up being fear of the truth you know to use that that term from that quote from hegel that ultimately we can't preempt these things and in our constant attempt to preempt all dangers we're actually leaving ourselves more open to them uh, in, overall, I mean, we we can see this with the kind of ways in which negative feedback, for example, from sort of very like tech pros, they don't take negative feedback well. Um, the machines can't really learn anything because they they've told their their underlings they're going to work, and their underlings aren't going to get a job anywhere else, so they just say yes, they work. And they they pat them on the head and give them a biscuit or something, and then a cyber truck just you know cruises into a a bin and explodes or something. Are we sort of reaching a sort of paradigm which? These pre preemptive systems are getting a bit more accelerated, intensified, and indeed, that's probably even more self-destructive in the kind of smart being that we that we are, at least in part today. No, exactly. I think that that's that's a great point, and I think that that actually highlights, you know, the, the problem with smart being is that it's not it's not smart at all. So, but we're all being kind of dragged along, you know, as as willing. Um, subjects in this kind of nonsensical experiment um, where things obviously, obviously, you know, we can't really um, predict things in the way that we, we would like. Um, it's, you know, like the number of errors that the police make, for example, in um, preemptive arrests. And even, for example, you know, a, a few years ago in the UK, it was um, uh, like, a lot of black men were being diagnosed with schizophrenia and without seeing a, a, any medical practitioner without you know that was just the police saying oh well they must be schizophrenic let's put them in prison um and then you know so it's it's by you know error is actually contained in its own mode of of functioning um and i think that the problem for us is how do we uh, organize um politically in a sense to avoid being caught up in this delusion because you know the tools that smart beings dis disposal basically functions in a, in, in a way to kind of say well you're either with us or you know you'll end up in prison um, there's no way not to participate in in this game let's say so um yeah i think that that is really the point of um tension and you know, 
should be a site of politics of how how do we kind of untangle ourselves from um this path of of destruction yeah one of one of the things that's kind of interesting in in taking up foucault though and this concept of smart being is that uh there there there's sort of this issue where you're running up against one of the the big organizing principles of uh, let's let's use the the negriest term the counter counter empire or counter power mm. of mobilizing this thing we call labor capacity right and one of the sort of great anti post hegelian moves that foucault makes in the early 70s is to refuse that labor is the essence mm. of of man and we we continue to see uh, in polemics on technology. I think Bernard Stiegler is sort of particularly uh, guilty of this. Is that sort of the unsmartness of smart being is actually diminishing uh, the possibility of of a smart being and diminishing our potentiality. And sort of you run. Foucault runs up against this and says, so long as the human being is sort of reduced to or proposed as um, essentially a being of labor, of work, uh, in a very existential sense, it's already entirely handed over to the machine that makes it work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And part of part of the Part of the resistance then becomes not just a sort of um, an active recognition, but also an active uh, refusal of particular um, assertions about, or any really assertion about the anthropological essence of the human being. And part of why I like um, smart being in relation to, to other uh, let's say, sort of conceptual personages, whether that be the docile body, Bloom, um, is the that precursor smart inherits a kind of history of not just um, attunement to a particular goal, being oriented towards a particular kind of optimization, but an environmental element as well, right? Your smart TV is attached to your Wi-Fi, which is attached mm -hmm. to your watch, which is attached to your smartphone, your smart car, your, and it produces um, a web of relations that one cannot escape. Um, and it makes individuals extraordinarily easy to surveil, uh, to police, but you know, most importantly, to, to very passively and indirectly direct uh the human being so i'm wondering that you've arrived at this this concept of sort of smart smart being but as it relates to the history of policing um can we see a direct relationship between sort of the, when I say technology, I mean in the most simple sort of day-to-day -day use of the term, the mm -hmm. technological environment that we've produced and sort of an att attempt at making these like set of relations that say the physiocrats did. Um, and are you showing us a, a genealogy? Are you trying to place one on top of the other? You know what what is occurring here in this relationship between mil between these two milieus? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I I think um, the two kind of do go hand in hand. And um, with reference to um, smart being, I think the question of of policing is more of a kind of self policing, a self um, yeah, the application of power onto oneself. Um, being one's own sovereign, but also extending that to other parts of the world. So um, taking, taking as a given its own kind of, um, let's say, 
the way it uses its tools, um, its own kind of epistemolo epistemology, um, and then judging and policing those who are not yet smart um, and basically a applying uh, a kind of surveillance and policing along those lines. Um, and this is able to be... Um, you know, manipulated, let's say, on social media, um, on, on Instagram, for example, with smart beings kind of um, essentially showing off an idea of the good life, um, an idea of uh, what's to be aspired to. Um, and, yeah, there's a kind of, um, I don't know if the right word is like CD element or just this kind of like, um, huge discomfort, especially, I don't know if you saw this recently with, um, there was like a, a video circulating, I think it was um, from the US or Israel or um, somewhere anyway, that basically said, oh, imagine Gaza without um, Hamas. And it was this video of like um, hotel resorts, um, fancy restaurants, people smiling in like a really kind of um, insincere way perhaps and it's just that vision of the world that's kind of presented as the best case scenario which is obviously a kind of soulless existence but having that vision functions as a way of policing um, imagination confining the imagination collapsing it into something that is very um, depressing alienating um commercial let's say um yeah so these these two kind of modes of articulating social life whether it's kind of you know the traditional um idea of policing that kind of emerged with um statistics concerned with morality concerned with enforcing um the work ethic that, in a sense, is, is absorbed into um, the idea of smart being, um, yeah. just using different tools of, of policing and self-management. Yeah. I think the example you just gave over from Instagram and the, and sort of the, the, the Zionist genocidal imagination is a very good example of the, yeah. the preemptive this is a smart being. I mean, remember once uh, we were on a show talking about our book with uh, an Israeli comrade, and he was talk he was translating this stuff, um, talking about well, uh, why didn't they respond to their own uh, intelligence systems? Well, because no one has ever said no to them, and they don't they don't believe they think they've already preempted everything with these magical systems. Which, uh, if you look at any of resistance videos, most of these anti drone devices and like they are just scams. You can fly drones up to them. And yeah. you can see in terms of their own military tactics, there's a smart being to them in the sense of, yes, everyone is trained for urban environments, but they're also, they also know they're sending in a conscript army who aren't very good at what they do. And so they do what my friends call sort of derisively emotional support bombing when they level the area around them. And then, of course, make their own training completely useless. And in doing so, they still have forgotten how to preempt not standing next to an open window. I mean, this is this is kind of the the, the smart being of sort of rendered because it is, it is the most technologically advanced army in the world, supposedly. Yeah. But that technology yeah. actually is only to secure a sense of their own securement, and that has left them com completely open and completely unable to respond to, to to error. In a sense, if anything, it's the cybernetic system seem to have completely collapsed in on themselves, and that's yeah. interesting because one thinks of smart being, but it's I reminded of a quote from earlier in, in your book you take from Baudrillard about how artificial intelligence isn't just fake on level of intelligence because rather it's fake on level of artifice because true artifice mm. comes in moments of contingency when security is is simply up in the air yeah no de de definitely that's exactly it and I think that you know what we what we're increasingly seeing is this um is basically the kind of the breakdown of um this kind of like fancy shiny future and the real impotence of um not just of the vision but of the individuals who make it up so the impotence of um smart being completely incapable incompetent um 
not knowing, yeah, not only not knowing what it's supposed to know or what it kind of um, preaches, but basically can't even organize um, their own life, let alone, um, yeah, imagination or, yeah, it's basically forgotten how to breathe and is telling everyone else how to in a way, yeah. And one of the things, though, that that's so terrifying about this drive towards optimization, and you point this out in the book, sort of using a Gombin, uh, where you write, as a Gombin points out, traditional political distinctions such as right and left lose their distinction at precisely the moment where biological life and its needs had become the politically decisive fact, and where the only real question to be decided was which form of organization would be best suited to the task of ensuring the care, control, and use of, of bear life. Um, and this goes back to that distinction uh, that you made earlier between, between sort of essence and existence um, that seems to be at the, at the sort of uh, tension point here, whether it's Xavier Bichat and the evocation of life um, or say, Rilke and creaturely life, or Benjamin and creaturely life, or or a rent. There's a, there, are, there are all these other attempts at trying to grasp this that come before Foucault and Agamben, but it's really in these two thinkers where it's actually the evocation itself that is the problem. And one of the the things that that you point out in specific and is the the made program in Canada, which mm. is. Uh, we've talked about it a few times on Acid Horizon, but never, and we've never dedicated as much time as we should uh, to it, which is uh, the medical assistance in dying uh, program, which is essentially uh, a program that is really in place to eliminate um, life that has been deemed unoptimized. Um, and as we have seen, there have been numerous tragic testimonies about uh, disabled people who, for lack of access to living conditions uh, that have been denied them by the government, the government has instead ensured that they can, in fact, kill themselves if that's, uh, if that's the issue that they've run up against. And one of the things that seems to be constantly lost is in this eugenic history, distinctions of right and left are extremely murky. Uh, for example, the biggest proponents of eugenics were British socialists yeah. and American Democrats, social Democrats. Um, and we tend to, to place eugenics really conveniently on this history of, of right-wing politics with sort of the, uh, the extremely um, grotesque, uh, instance of of Nazi eugenics, of Action T4, um, and of the Holocaust, but this eugenic mode of thinking hasn't left. Uh, you know, at it, it's not like with the Nuremberg trials, these things went away. And in fact, Carl Brandt right said that this question of euthanasia will return. Um, and and Agamben quotes that. And I I would think part of what uh, your text is doing is saying it, it not only didn't have to return, it never went away. So mm -hmm. it's kind of been the principle of, of, um, of, of governance since at least the physiocratic age, but at the level of political ontology, the risk, has, the danger has always been there. Um, and this you share kind of with Agamben in his work, uh, Stasis, right, where Agamben mm -hmm. wants to show that sovereignty really is linked up. But when we talk about uh, eugenics sort of being something that is shared by both the left and the right, we then have to look back again to, to your use of Foucault on the essence of man as labor um, and show that maybe the organizing principles of left-wing politics which is, again, this desire for a saccharine, clean, um, perfectly organized, perfectly rational life um, is 
perhaps a little bit more fascistic than we than we want to admit um because at least in in the 30s and 40s a lot of left wing thinkers were talking about uh how capitalism's fundamental problem is that it's an irrational organization of life right uh or the the irrationality of technical rationality mm -hmm. um and instead what could be brought forth is is in fact a rational world that's rationally organized and if if this is the shared vision of both the right and the left but the only thing that distinguishes them is the kind of policing necessary to achieve it how can we understand and this is of course getting to the later chapters of your book a politics that releases ourselves from uh from the necessity of clinging to this organizing principle of of operation and of the smoothness of human operation yeah again you know that's that's a great question and one that's not obviously um easy to to answer but it's it's definitely necessary to to think through and i you know the 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 problem is that once once you have you know let's let's continue along the lines of um the question of labor so once that is accepted as a uh, human essence um and something that um all human beings need to participate in then obviously you know as you've as you've laid out the question for government whether that's right or left is simply yeah to manage that process using um tools that might vary and um the practices are essentially you know haven't really changed all that much from um intellectual tools that we've inherited from figures like Francis Galton um statistician and eugenicist the idea of um you know the mean the average uh etc you know these things are very much alive in in our thinking um and not really um kind of exceptions as as you've suggested so um another thing that these tools kind of make possible is to think of um the human being as um you know along the question of value not to value the human being but to as precisely assign it um a numerical value we could we could say um that either qualifies it for um kind of you know encouragement support or um direction in a particular way probably towards efficiency productivity or for annihilation and biopolitics basically um wraps that up in a sense um and presents the idea of the individual as independent from the social network let's say that it might be um yeah that it's it's living in um and masks the idea of um the like human beings being expendable to a certain degree that it produces a continuous stream of expendable individuals so whether it's um uh so for example the idea of the click workers that makes smart being um possible uh or even in environmental contexts you know the huge amount of energy required in order for um you know a data center that nobody uses to stay alive whilst homelessness um homelessness rates increase etc but it's that dynamic of um a huge mass of expendable let's say lives used at the expense of what aristotle would call the free man so for aristotle the free person uh contains the slave as its own condition of possibility so today you know we could say the free citizen the citizen of the uk already you know how contains the exploitation of um thousands of migrants let's say who die in the mediterranean so you know how do we go about organizing a different way of articulating politics is to recognize that dynamic and to refuse it you know to refuse to participate within a system that 
basically takes that as a given. You know, that is presupposed. That's not really something that we're supposed to be talking about. That's why in the UK, you know, um, in the run up to the general election, it was, oh, well, you know, don't focus on foreign policy. Foreign policy doesn't really have anything to do with um, domestic policies, i.e., you know, just just forget about all that happening. Um, so how do we think about things differently? You know, Deleuze, for example, reminds us that it's actually what's, what might appear to be furthest away from us that's actually closest and um, more kind of connected than we would like to think. And it's just to remember that. So for Foucault, going back to um, his work on the anthropology or his work on the production of knowledge, you know, he's, he's interested in the unconscious of thought. That's that which has been discarded um, from thought in a similar way. Um, you know, the parts, the bits of language that we discard don't disappear. They exist as shadows to our mode of thought. So rather than assuming that the present um, is somehow a given, that the assumptions are basic truths, you know, perhaps try to rethink those. And, you know, this isn't an individual task. That's why, uh, you know, in the book, I try to experiment with this idea of what a collective intellect might look like, um, inspired from the writings of um, Albert Roes, Ibn Rushd, um, and Dante, for whom, you know, the, mul the multitude cogitates that we might each have our own um, individual intelligence, but the intellect is collective. And that's something for um, all of us to kind of participate in. Um, yeah. Do you want to go ahead, Adam? No. Yeah, no I, no, I was wondering actually how this, this notion of collective intellects relates to the idea of, of institutions or institutions as securities or base mechanisms. Because as you as was mentioning about the general election, I mean, well, the previous regime were mostly about stripping the entire, all these institutions of the parts, keeping them running as base management machines, and then, you know, sending it off to whatever, you know, X by account we failed to remove the head of a couple hundred years ago. But the yeah. current, the current uh, thousand Nakia Reich we have right now is more about actually believes the institutions are quite, quite viciously so, which is why the Home Office has announced, you know, their, their new immigration raids because we have the more competent uh, fascisti in power in Britain now. And um, I mean, thinking about terms of emboldening institutions, there's also a lot of huge focus in, in your book about the question of constituent power or doing your door, you know, something like de institutionalizing power. I want to ask how this notion of collective intellect relates to challenging biopolitical operations as they stand on the level of, of institutional thinking. Because in a way, these institutions rely on this separation between sort of life and the way it's lived in order to channel life through it as a kind of a battery. Um, it needs to keep us moving through these circuits in order so that they have something to work on, be it the welfare system, be it what remains of our healthcare system, which is mostly about generating metrics for various pharmaceutical companies at this point. Um, how do we challenge these things on the level of their their own conceptualization as institutions and how does that how do you think that catches out by thinking about it in terms of this collective intellect this multitudinous rather than individual being because of course as an individual you know it it, it, it would be hard not to relapse you know, as, as you point out something like you know uh, homo economicus or this rational just we have to make a map of the institutional territory and then one of us the brain genius <laughs> do that and then you know the, the one the, the essential human to the operation draws the map and then everyone else is channeled into the circuits to sort of reform the territory but that's of course that's not that's not what's happening here with this theory of the multitude yeah that's a that's that's a great question and you know as you as you've said you know the institutions that um we rely on today um you know aren't, aren't even doing what they're supposed to be doing um if we think about if we think about it in the context of law, you know, this idea of a rules-based international order that um, we're all being promised kind of exists at precisely the moment that it's supposed to be 
um, doing something with regards to the ongoing genocide in Palestine, um, it fails to. So it might put out statements here and there, you know, advisory opinions, but it seems that, yeah, these things aren't necessarily enforced and they continue to exist, perhaps just, you know, symbolically. Um, so how might we think of that um, differently? Well, in the first instance, you know, the question to ask is, you know, can we think of institution away from identity and representation? And away from um, setting up, you know, having an institution with a view of a kind of transcendent principle that would then come to define its mode of operation. So to kind of do away with the idea of application and realization, and rather think of institution as something that might be um, that that has its sense precisely because of a form of life, rather than the other way around. So, you know, the current setup presents institutions as um, that which kind of directs how life should be lived. So how, how can we collectively think of, in a way, the opposite? But obviously, that's not necessarily something that's easy. Um, but in law, the idea of institution, at least going back to... Um, Roman law, it, it had precisely that sense of instituting life in a way that isn't um, generalizable, um, but kind of functions in relation to specific ways of, of living, specific modes of life. Um, and then, yeah, institutions kind of come about not necessarily as um, prescriptive um, or governmental or managerial tools, but rather just um, as 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 a way, as a as a manner of life, um, and so that is of that. That is definitely a question for the collective rather than um, for the individual, because it only makes sense um, in view of a modus operandi or a um, modus vivendi of the multitude um, yeah i think that sort of one of the key questions in biopolitics as a system of thought is how can we arrive at a sort of different approach to the question of of life and the way in which it takes its form and the answer sort of lies in a kind of the, the the stakes are tethered between you know how we exist and how our existence is intelligible so mm -hmm. in a certain way part of the practice here is understanding how how we've arrived um, at this point, in a certain sense, like this is a practical philosophy. And okay. I know that that term has been just absolutely devastated. Like it's like Reiner Sherman died. And now the, the, it's this horrendous Anglo-American, like, <laughs> um, but one of the sort of problems is trying to take that step back to mm -hmm. sort of disengage and this process of disempowerment um, is, is an extraordinarily difficult one, right? Uh, you know, smart being is not a threshold you reach. Like, now you are a smart being, right? No. But it's a, it's a perpetual sort of insertion and reinsertion into a series of... of what maybe Hume would call incentives, right? Or uh, what Foucault would call disciplinary apparatuses. And trying to, to take a step back and mm -hmm. not to be able to identify, okay, this is um, a result of cybernetic governance. This is you know, only possible once uh, let's say like the stockade of the asylum becomes the definitive mechanism of understanding mm 
um, you know, abnormal human experience. But getting to the basis of these things at the level of epistemology. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there are so many radical political projects who that want to uh, produce, let's say, an egalitarian future, but only on the basis of maintaining all of these various epistemic frameworks. Yeah. So one of the core questions, I think, continues to be, you know, and in this way, the book is kind of like, uh, you know, Diogenes of Sinope sort of scratching at uh, contemporary politics saying it's like, well, how can you take all of the preconditions of liberalism and then say you've arrived at something at something else? And it, it and you you make extensive use of the various analyses analyses in Foucault's sort of mid 70s work society must be defended and one of the most sort of interesting comments Foucault makes is that socialism arrives and it has no governmentality mm -hmm. so it just it just borrows it appropriates the entirety of liberalism and to arrive now finally at the question <laughs> I feel like I'm at a conference like, well, this is more of a comment um, <laughs> in this resurgence of, let's say, Rousseauianism that's occurring in political thought on sort of the left in places like the United States and the UK. Mm. Um, isn't it possible to just see the replication of of liberalism ad infinitum and is that not part of the uh and is that not part of the um part of the brilliance of of liberal governmentality is that it veils over all of the presupposed notions <laughs> that make it possible and put forward an extraordinarily complex set of political relations that no matter what you do in dealing with those uh those relations those objects remain kind of unexamined no definitely and i think that that is you know that that's partly the question that i was kind of asking myself um when i was deciding to to, to write this um was precisely that you know how how is it possible that um, you know, we kind of continue to read critically, you know, we're reading Foucault, we're reading um, Agamben and whoever else. And then, you know, in terms of political practice, it's always, it always comes down to the same thing, um, you know, backing a certain candidate, um, etc. And yeah, so that's, that's partly what I wanted to understand myself. And I remember it was, it was sometime during COVID, um, where Isabelle Garot, she wrote um, an article on biopolitics, um, basically saying that actually, you know, it, it, biopolitics kind of depoliticizes um, and isn't a useful way of thinking about, um, yeah, social emancipation, communism, etc. And I remember reading it at the time, and I reread it a few times, and I thought to myself, actually, you know. To be fair, it is a good criticism of of biopolitics. Okay, you know some of the theoretical arguments in relation to Foucault and Agamben might not be entirely correct, but you know that is that is the challenge. You know how do we um, how do we go about organizing politically by um, not falling into the trap of um, you know the legal framework, which is biopolitical. It is an inheritance of of liberalism, etc. That's just one example. And but the question that I would pose to Isabel Garo is that, well, not just her, but you know, people who kind of take that perspective, is that 
yeah, I fully agree. You know, we need to organize um, politically. There needs to be mass social organization. Um, and then, you know, the argument that they put forward is that then you gain power, you get in, and then, and then that's it. Then what? You know, we've seen it happen many times where, you know, whether it's in, um, in Chile, where, you know, they, there was a huge, massive mobilization. First thing they decided to do after winning the election, okay, let's redraft the constitution. And then let's put that constitution forward to a referendum. And then, of course, they lose that referendum and then the far right um, take charge. Or, you know, what happened in Greece and what happens everywhere. But there's a kind of um, underestimation, I would say, of international institutions, whether they're international financial institutions like the IMF or the, or, or the EU, etc., there's a whole host of of questions and presuppositions kind of cast aside. So whilst, you know, I am sympathetic to the concerns, I would say that actually, you know, perhaps perhaps there is a mystification there um, as well, or, you know, that they don't recognise a, a certain mystification that, um, frankly, is also, um, can also be described as um, depoliticizing. And um, this, yeah. this concept of depoliticization is, is a frustrating one. And we saw it emerge out of COVID. Um, and it was extraordinarily opportunistic to like mm -hmm. the, the thinkers that became sort of the, um, the the stalwart we need a new politics were in fact like the stalest uh had the, essentially the stalest uh proposals which was just like you know we got to take up uber as a as a you know as or you can or, say uh, the words ben bratton will it's fine on this podcast he's not listening and, he, and we don't like him anyway you know but benjamin benjamin bratton's position was essentially we need a positive biopolitics yeah exactly or, Perotsov or uh, frankly Nancy and Esposito or like oh well we can democratize biopolitics but of course all of these things uh, res have resulted in perpetual catastrophe mm -hmm. and what this book I think really really leaps into and I think you share this with Agamben in a particular way which is that so long as these things remain unexamined mm -hmm. and you take the entirety of uh, the object of politics um, and then fight on that ground, you really can't be surprised when mm -hmm. you take the right wing position on the very ontological uh, basis of politics and then lose. <laughs> um, because you never fought it. Uh, there was never a fight put up to begin with, and your your concept of uh, counteractualization, which mm -hmm. I think is towards the I'm trying to find it, which I think is towards the end of this book, uh, is one that I think is extremely compelling. And when folks respond, well, you know, it's very easy to to, to simply wash your hands of it? Uh, the answer is no. It's actually really, really hard mm -hmm. to, to find everyday ways of disengagement mm -hmm. from, from these, these uh, modes of production, from these uh, conditions of existence. And in this sense, one of the things that I really appreciate about books like yours is that it searches for a politics that can't be confined to the parliamentary. Mm -hmm. And it shows that though the parliamentary system can produce this amazing spectacle of opposition, um, these distinctions are historically not, not as important when the object of management is, is the, the sacrosanct protection of the life of the population. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the justification that makes possible the kind of, 
despicable uh, attestations of, for example, uh, representatives of 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 the occupation forces in in Gaza. They can say, "Well, four hundred people can die because we had to take out." someone we thought who might be somehow possibly someone who knows maybe somebody who knows somebody who who works with this member of of uh hamas and this total uh, mobilization of the population that is simultaneously uh extremely vulnerable but at the same time extraordinarily powerful and the source of all uh, and the source of all um, sort of vitality or vibrance of of our government is the trap that that we ourselves fall into, um, and we can't be surprised when these occupation forces mock us mm -hmm. with the entire history of really political ontologies that led up to uh, this, this imperial object sitting um, in front of us. And in a certain sense, you know, I think your book shows us the importance of um, how we, in the importance of how we interpret the object of politics before we start actually getting into the, uh, the spectacle of what we call today, which is not political politics, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'm wondering, you know, as all of these things sort of um, circulate, you sort of make a bold gesture that there can be no guarantee. Mm -hmm. And why do you think it's important to resist that necessity of a guarantee? Um, why is it nece necessary to put forward the reality of disappointment? Because I think it's, it's, it's important to not be um, put off by the possibility of um, there not being a guarantee in order precisely to um, to be able to act. You know, things, affects like fear um, or, yeah, I would say mainly, mainly fear, a kind of, they're a huge obstacle to being able to, um, to think because thinking necessarily involves, you know, a kind of um, disintegration, a kind of... Um, feeling of being lost or um yeah it's just, it's just, it's some kind of struggle and um yeah by by believing in the idea of um certainty um and then you know being disappointed when that you know that never actually arrives um then one might then shy away from you know trying again picking um, yeah, picking up different um, strategies, etc. So I think, yeah, the fact that there might be no guarantee also kind of um, rejects a certain teleology that actually, you know, this happens in the beginning and then that happens in the end and we all live happily ever after. I think that, you know, ultimately, yeah, of course, there's no guarantee, but that's not the point. You know, we're always in the middle of things, as um, Deleuze would say, and we continue to be in the middle. Um, and that's that's part of that's part of the process. Um, yeah. Well, I just wanted to to thank you one more time for coming on the show, and perhaps one way that we can talk about this book is to say that really it is it is a book searching for the politics of the undefinable day-to-day -day work of, of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, so for that reason, uh, I really appreciate it. Adam, do you have anything to close with? I could go on a diatribe about 
anthropology and cybernetics, but let, we don't want it to last another two hours. So I, I will park it there and say, Therene, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for having me, both of you.